At only 31 years old, Dana Mathewson has risen to the elite rankings of women's wheelchair tennis, having made the U.S. squad to both Rio in 2016 and Tokyo in 2020. She's been a member of the World Cup team a staggering nine times already and is currently ranked ninth in singles by the International Tennis Federation. Welcome, Dana. Hello, how are you? Really well. It's been a lot of years. Uh, I think it was probably about seven or eight years ago, and you were you were on on the rise then. But it seems like you're really moving up, um, Dana. You know, I want to get get right off at you know to talk about you know some of the things I read about you. Uh, you tried a number of different sports as you were moving up, and you know, frankly, I, I I know that you have really good abdominal control, so you could have succeeded in virtually any sport. You could have chosen basketball. You could have been a racer. But what was it that drew you to tennis? What was the magnetism there? Um, it's a great question. It's not one that I get asked a lot, actually. Uh, I. I'm not really sure. I, I remember little snippets of my first time playing tennis. It was at a, a USTA all-comer camp for juniors um, in Coronado. And I was about 13 years old. And I remember something about picking up a racket and just feeling that feeling like any tennis player will understand this. Like once you hit the ball perfectly in that sweet spot, there's just a feeling that you can't really describe. And it just, it's like, it's euphoric. And I don't know if that was the feeling that I got that day or what, but it just kind of stuck. And it's ironic because anytime I tried tennis when I was able-bodied, I did not like it. So for some reason, in a wheelchair, I ended up loving tennis. And that's not to say I don't like other sports because I did play basketball all through high school. But tennis just has something that clicks for me. I think it's a lot more dynamic. I have to rely on myself to get results. Um, and I think I like that pressure in a way. I love it and hate it. I like all the problem solving that's involved in tennis. Um, the travel is something very unique to the sport, and I love that. And yeah, I think overall it challenges me more than other sports would, and, and I like that. You know, that's kind of interesting. You should bring that up because I was reading a couple of quotes about you, and I'm going to do a little paraphrasing here. But you said, you know, you credit your mental your mental game to your preparation. But tennis is, you said, 30 to 40 percent mental. And you said there's a lot of time to either focus on doubt and negative thoughts or a lot more time to tell yourself what to do next. So what is it meant for you to be able to work with a sports psychologist and, you know, learn more about the chess match, that being tennis? Um, it's been so helpful in my career. I wish that I started sooner working with a mental skills coach or a sports psych. Um, I only started working with one, um, Dr. Larry Lauer, ever since I came here to Orlando just before COVID hit, so back in 2020. And it's been amazing. Um, I think that a lot of people, whether they know tennis or not, they they know, like, you know Rafael Nadal, and he's notorious for his routine he does, where he picks the wedgie, does the thing with his eyebrows, puts his hair behind his ears every single time. A complete rhythm, huh? Person, yeah. And to the average person, that just looks really neurotic. But once I started learning about sports, like I realized that there's a method behind that madness, so to speak, and it's so that you make everything a routine so that every point feels the same, whether it's the first point of the match to the match point, and whether that's in a semifinal match at a tiny tournament to semifinal match at a grand slam. So um, I think learning the different tools and learning to have strategies of my own, learning to have little routines of my own, um, understanding what to do in those 25 seconds between points has really been crucial to me because those 25 seconds can either hurt you or help you a lot depending on what you do in your head. And um, that's been crucial to my latest successes, I think, because I had, you know, I needed to brush up a lot on my tennis. I still do, as like, like any athlete. And the physical part, I've gotten a lot better at. But the mental game was where I very much lagged behind a lot of my competitors. And I'm still working to get better and better there. But it's definitely helpful. So you've had tremendous success in doubles. You play with uh, with Lucy Shuker. And you guys have done really well. Um what is it? I mean, I, I mean, I think I get it. As a, playing as a, as a doubles team, you've got someone else to rely on. You fall short, they pick up the slack. But what is it that you're going to have to do to go over the top and become one of the preeminent singles players? Um, 
You know, I think that there's a confidence that I have in doubles that I don't quite have yet in singles. And I know that sounds silly because if you look at my resume, it looks like I wouldn't ever get nervous playing tennis matches or that, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be so nerve-wracking for me, but in tennis, I feel like, you know, in singles at least you're out there by yourself in a singles match. If you're playing well, it's amazing. If you're not, it's a horrible feeling. And sometimes fear of messing up can really, again, this is all the mental stuff, fear of making mistakes can really limit you from playing how you're actually capable of playing. And that's something that I struggle with at times. Um, so again, I think mentally I just need to work on being brave in, this, in the times I need to be brave. And that has come out in some matches where I've had some great successes, but it doesn't always come out when I need it to. And that's just something I'm working on and I'm lucky that I have a partner like Lucy where I get along with her so well and we bring out the best in each other. And again, doubles is different from singles in terms of strategy as well, so there are differences. But I think that I need to translate how I feel more confident in doubles to my singles career a little bit to break through that next little barrier. I completely get it. And, you know, when we were covering tennis back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, even into the 2000s, I saw that you know, the one preeminent rule in the game is the two bounce rule. But you guys are relying less and less on that with uh, seemingly every year. Is it the chair? Is it the players? How is it that you guys are able to uh, to get so close to the net and play such a more strat strategy oriented game? Um, I think it's a mixture of all the things you brought up. I think that Again, just to remind anyone listening, the only difference between wheelchair tennis and able body tennis is that we are allowed to have a second bounce as long as the first bounce is in the regulation court. But the court is the same, the net height's the same, the equipment we use is the same, aside from the chairs, obviously. Um, but I think that a lot of it is that our chairs are getting faster and faster in terms of the equipment that, or sorry, the materials that are used to build them. Like some, some players in Japan even have chairs made of magnesium now. Um, a lot of chairs are either aluminum or titanium and then you can mess around with having carbon fiber, you can mess around with all these different things. But again, I think that we're also having players that are more professionalized, that are stronger, that are more fit. Rich, I think, um, oh there we go. Oh, you froze up for a second. Oh, is that okay? Yeah. We can fix okay. it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying that I feel like players now are a lot, just a lot more fit. They're a lot stronger. And so between that combination of being a fitter athlete with having lighter chairs, you can just get there faster. And, and it's like you said, we don't really use two bounces unless someone hits an amazing shot and we just can't get there in time. But a lot of the time it looks very similar tempo-wise to an able-bodied match. You know, you bring up the chair, and I noticed uh, watching in the Paralympics that the chairs went, you know, at, at a certain point in history for a decade, they went from four wheels to three wheels. And now you guys are back to using more of a four wheel chair with an anti tipper in the back. Explain a little bit about the chair and and not just that, but, you know, you talked about all the substances, but the strapping system that makes you one with the chair. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the standard or I guess run of the mill tennis chair that you'll see has the two small wheels in the back, one wheel, or sorry, in the front, one wheel in the back, which is the anti tip bar, and then the two bigger wheels on the side. So, all in all, we've got five wheels touching the ground at any given time. Um, I think that they just realized that that was the most stable frame because you want to have a stable base and that's how you'll you'll turn better do you know what I mean you'll get more grip on the ground when you're trying to start a push I wish that I could say the exact engineering why they chose that but I, I think it really is just a matter of being the most stable um, stable chair that works for all different disability types you know, Dana, as I was uh, doing a little research, I found out that, and not that I didn't know this, but the Dutch players have had a real heck of a run in tennis. Yeah, uh, Esther Vergeer <laughs> had a nine-year run at the top starting in 2000, 2002, and uh, it's uh, Didi, Didi De Groot? Dita. D Dita De Groot uh, yes. has swept all the majors and won gold in the Paralympics. So what is it about the the netherlands and their culture is it is this in their blood or have they really cultivated this sport why are they so successful you know i wish i knew and then i would bottle it up and drink it myself um i think that 
they are very fortunate because their men's players are very good as well. They, they haven't had the same run that the women have, but they're very good. I think right now for quads, they have the world number one as well. So they're dominating two out of three divisions, which is pretty impressive. Um, I think it's because geographically, if you look at that country, it's incredibly small. I think you can drive across it within an hour or less than two hours at least. So a lot of the players are able to train with each other all the time and a lot of their players are very high ranked so you've got really good people that you're hitting against all the time, day in, day out. So even when you're not at a tournament, you can have matches against these people. You can train against their type of ball. The, the women can play against the men. Like it's, it's a very, very beneficial thing. Um, my setup is a little different in that I am the only wheelchair player, for instance, where I live. And that's very similar for a lot of other players, whether they be from South America, China, Japan. Um, we're not all afforded that um, geographical bonus of having everybody so close. Um, and I think that's, that's a really big thing that's helped them for such a long time. And also, they're just really talented and they must just have some really, really good coaches over there teaching them something that the rest of us are missing. But yeah, Dita and Esther are special. They're very amazing players. So you do revere your past and you look at these people and your future. I mean, these are these are very tough players. We, uh, you know, we interviewed uh, Mariska Berger, who's, uh, you know, like the queen of basketball. She's from the Netherlands also. And she had mentioned that, you know, the the country, you know, pays them to play. And do you think that that's, a, you know, is, is that coming to, to the United States? Will there, there be a day and a time when you as a disabled tennis player will be able to get paid to do your craft? Um, well, tennis and basketball are very different. So I do get played, paid to play tennis. Um, tennis is one of the more professionalized adaptive sports in that I earn prize money, whereas basketball players don't. So if they didn't get that, they wouldn't earn any money unless they were paid to do so by being on a team. So I think it's amazing that, that they're afforded that um, in Holland. I know that some other countries like in um, Italy and Germany and France also offer those opportunities. So a lot of American basketball players actually have flown and moved over there to, to be able to be professional. But yeah, luckily in tennis, um, we are afforded that opportunity. So I'm really grateful for that. I think that um, at least in terms of basketball, I don't know if there will be a time anytime soon that people would be paid to play here. I would love for that to happen. We have so many good players and there would be so many good leagues and teams out here, but I'm not sure if basketball will, will get over here anytime soon. Well, you're currently ranked ninth in the world and you've got your sights set on Paris in just a sh two short years. I mean, it's a really short, it's a, it's a little short jump between, you know, the last games in, in Beijing and now, and now Paris is coming up right around the corner. Thank you so much for joining us, Dana, and, and sharing your insights. Yeah, thank you for having me. You asked some great questions and I, I really enjoyed talking with you.